Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Drive Pink Dialogue. We're here for episode number 23, where we're reviewing Inner Miami's 6 2 loss to Chattanooga. Wait a minute. It looks like that was the B team. The A team got back to winning ways. I'm seeing here, it looks like a 3 2 victory on the road in MLS. Can that be right? Are we back in the good times now? I don't know how to react because it's been a while since the Miami has made me happy about anything. So <laughs> good for us. 3-2 victory. Not perfect by any means, but at this point, I'll take the three points and we are top of the table. So let's go. Yes, it's Sunday, the day after the game. Uh, as always, I'm your host, Scotty. I'm here with my co-host, Soar. How are you feeling? It's been a roller coaster of a week so far, I think. I will say I'm happy that we reverted back to the regular normal formation. We finally got a victory in what after five games, uh, or at least it feels like an eternity. Um, as I said, it wasn't perfect by any means. The bitter taste of being knocked out of the CONCACAF is still there, but at least we're on the road to recovery. And hopefully this is a positive sign that we're just going to move upwards from here and leave behind all the misery of this past week. The last win before last night was the road trip to Audi Field in D.C., and that was four weeks ago. So it had been five games, but almost a whole month between victories for Inter Miami, a team that we expected to be winning almost all of their games, right? And so it was really hard to go through that stretch. Um, I know we played... Monterrey twice, and they're a good team. And then maybe we were sort of resting and resetting for some of those. There was the international break. But still, almost an entire month without a win. Feels good to get back on the winning side. Three points last night and a few other results took us back to top of the table. I know that we still have played more games than than the other teams, but 15 points and the highest goal differential um, the Red Bulls, who we've already seen this year, also at 15, and the Galaxy, also at 15. So, um, you know, we played Galaxy pretty tough on the road. It feels like a much better picture looking at the table than it did a week ago, for sure. Yeah, some positivity to take into the next week. And all we can ask right now is just win our games, get the points on the board, and hopefully the vibes change, the players start believing in themselves and we can put on a good run going on from here because God knows we'll need it from now on. Yes. Let's talk about, let's spend a little bit more time talking about the lineup and our pregame thoughts because we didn't do a pregame show. Um, We got the lineup about an hour before kickoff. It didn't, they they didn't give us the formation like they normally do, um, but it did seem like it was going to be a 4-3-3. 442 4231 but a four in the back system something that I think we both wanted what was your initial thought when you saw the lineup I was a bit disappointed in Tata for not being more experimental because I think and looking at the way the team played we need a few players to rest now it's high time that you give Gressel game off Jordi Alba with having played two intense games we saw what happened with his injury I was hoping some of the big players would be rested and some of the younger players given an opportunity, especially players who were coming off uh, after an injury. I would have loved to see Franco Negri play again. Maybe Kramaski start. He might not be fully fit to start a game yet, obviously regaining match fitness. Um, Very happy that we were back into that back four. It was a bit of a toss-up whether we were going to play the 4-2-3-1, whether we were going to play the 4-3-3. And I felt throughout the game it was quite fluid. Um, I think Gomez played that left wing role instead of the midfield role. We were defending with a 4-4-2. So there was a lot of fluidity there, but it was good to be back in a back four. And the game played out in our favor, but I would have hoped to see a little bit more rotation. Yeah, we are going to go into a nice phase of playing one game a week. I don't love that as a fan just because I like to watch the team play. But for the guys, it means they'll have plenty of rest, training, et cetera, recovery time. So it doesn't really surprise me. Our next midweek game is May 15th, so that's a month from now. This is their best 11 right now, I think. Um, This 10 of the same starters we saw against Monterey in the midweek 
No Allen comes out. David Ruiz goes back in. Ruiz was suspended for that midweek game. So feels like pretty effortlessly, at least not including the guys that are coming back from injury and are working their way back. Um, those were the best 11 players. Tata found a way to put them all on the field together. And we just had a talent advantage that I didn't think Sporting KC could really hold up with. Um, Diego Gomez going to the left wing. Um, you know, we can talk about what the actual formation and structure was, but at least he was the guy responsible for being the attacking threat down that left side, making those runs in behind, being a, a menace sort of not just in the midfield, but a little bit higher up the pitch. Is that what you wanted to see? I mean, we both thought Leo Alfonso might start. Um, I mean, what did you what did you want to see when, uh, you know, going into this game? Yeah, we discussed this, and I think the most that we wanted to see from this team was just being more structurally sound, having a more offensive threat in the final third, and overall just put up a performance because we we were missing against Monterey in that midweek game, and we just needed a bit of a reaction, a little bit of positive vibes overall, and we got most of it, so I was happy with that, and I think... Gomez on the left wing side might be a bit of a revelation going forward. I know he played in that position for Paraguay in the pre-Olympics, but Tata prefers him in that midfield. But while Robert Taylor is away, I think Gomez, Gomez on that left wing might actually be a really good solution to our issues on that side of the pitch. I don't know if that's his best position. He played there in the, in the preseason for a little bit, which wasn't the best. I think he was a lot better when he was playing in the midfield, but I think he's just gained a level of confidence now that he is making an influence on whichever part of the field he's put in. So it'll be good to have that weapon going forward with Kramaski back as well. I think there's going to be a few midfield changes that we're going to see with perhaps Gomez playing further up top. Yeah. I, I, I am so very confident that we are going to talk about Diego Gomez at some point later on in this episode, but I agree with you. The thing he was missing last year was that precision on the final pass or on the shot. And he's been excellent at that this year. And so while I think your ideal lineup still has him in the midfield um, because he's so unbelievably disruptive and it's really awesome. Uh, when you don't have Robert Taylor and your options are, playing a back five or playing Diego Gomez in a, in a front three, definitely give me Diego Gomez up there every single game. And until Robert Taylor comes back, I would, I would like to see that as long as we have enough midfielders. Um, there was not a great game from the back line, not a great game from the front two in terms of Messi and Suarez, not a great game from the midfield with Busquets and Julian Gressel. And I'm speaking about in the Monterey game, but they all get the start. Um, does this tell you anything about Tata? Like, what is the psychology of this decision where you get run off the field, or at least, listen, they capitulated against Monterey in that second half. And yet he just ran out these same players. So to me, that tells me he doesn't blame the players for that performance. And I think I tend to agree with that. But what does that say to you? Yeah, I think, Tata's shown that he likes to be consistent in his team selections. And unless there's an absolute uh, necessity to make a change, he will probably play the same preferred 11 that he has. And I'm not sure whether that's him taking responsibility for that game against Monterey, but he knew that he needed a result in this game. And if if Inter Miami even drew the game or worst case, worst case situation lost the game, that fans would be up in arms and he would be under a lot of pressure and he knew he needed a win. He knew he needed a reaction from his players. And I think his thinking was mostly, these are the set of players that are going to go and get me the result. And I agree with you in the sense that he, this was potentially a sign that he didn't necessarily blame the players themselves for the result against Monterey. And he tweaked a few things around, but for him, I think the personnel was the one that was going to get him the result, and he went with his best possible 11. We promised on our last episode that we would spend a whole segment talking about just Tata Martino's decisions in this game, and so we will. Um, so maybe we should just get right into the, the scoring and the action because uh, 
we're going to talk about SKC. We're going to talk about what the team did right and wrong. We're going to give out some awards, as always. Uh, but we're going to try and do it on a little bit of a condensed schedule today just because we all got things to do. Um, so let's get right into it. Eric Tommy, their right winger, first goal in the sixth minute. Cello Wiegand has a really bad turnover. And because it's not just a bad turnover, but a bad turnover in a bad spot, they have a four-on-three advantage. Um, the ball finds itself to Eric Tommy, who sort of at the edge of the box has really nice placement on a shot. I don't, I didn't ever saw a really great angle if Calendar could have made a play on it, but it didn't seem like it. Um, and it was just sort of this thing where you have three defenders back there trying to guard four people, and it just wasn't going to work. And they made us pay by not missing the shot, not getting, you know, up, taking a bad touch or whatever. They just made it happen. Any thoughts? I mean, Cello was not great in this game. And I think this was disappointing because he wasn't great in the Monterey game. And that seemed to have continued into this one. I think he started off really poorly. I think the team started off really poorly. It seemed like we had a bit of a hangover from the Monterey game and I was ready to be in for a long night again. Um, KC started with a high press, high intensity, got us to turn over the ball. I think Cello Wiegand, I don't know what he was thinking in that particular play, just running back towards his goal, gets pushed off, looks for a foul. I think it was too soft. Um, gives them an opportunity to make a play. And Tommy with a with bit of a weird looping sort of a shot that just popped into the corner. And my initial reaction was, why isn't Drake Adler doing better on this? I saw the replays and it was a little bit away from him, so he technically couldn't have done much. But I, yeah, it was a bit of a shock to start with. Again, Inter Miami on the back foot to begin. Not a great start overall. And it felt to me like it was a little bit of a shock because, you know, Cello, it just like the first minute, minute and a half, Inter Miami had a nice play where they found Cello down the right wing yeah. and he puts a cross in and, you know, he doesn't find someone at the end of the play. But it felt like Inter Miami was going to take the game to them right away. And then here we are, three or four minutes later, and all of a sudden, Inter Miami's losing. This does seem to be a theme for them when they go on the road to give up an early goal. That's maybe a conversation for another day. But uh, moving forward, it didn't take that long for Inter Miami to get back into it. They were seemingly really slow for the first 15 or so minutes. I thought they really struggled to get the ball past the midfield. But eventually, the goal comes. Um, Toto Aviles just plays the ball right through Cello Wiegand to Gressel. Gressel pops it off to Lionel Messi, and Messi sees Diego Gomez making the run, makes a beautiful through ball beyond the defense. Diego Gomez takes the first time, and it's even at one. And to me, this was like the turning point in the game where Inter Miami was just going to win from there. Talk to me about that play. Two things, I think. First of all, the only player on that pitch who can see that pass is Messi and executed to perfection. He saw Diego Gomez's run coming in even before anybody else around him did. I thought he was going to pop it into Luis Suarez, who was also in a bit of a free position. But what a fantastic pass. Beautiful assist. And then the second part was Diego Gomez's run. I think if he's playing that left wing position, he's going to have to continue to do those runs that Robert Taylor is so um, apt at doing. And I was really happy to see that Diego Gomez was making those runs from the wing to the center and giving those options to the number 10 to try and put in some of the balls. Great finish as well. Took a little bit of a deflection of the keeper's foot, but fantastic finish, fantastic goal, great reaction. Yeah, we're going to talk about Diego Gomez, so I will keep this short. But I wanted to just talk about the run he made because I went back and watched it. It's a, it's a long 25, 30-yard run, and he, as soon as Julian Gressel gets the ball and pops it towards Messi, so before Messi even gets on the ball, he's not even 100% sure if this is an accurate pass to Messi, but as soon as the ball comes in Messi's direction, Diego Gomez makes the run, and you're right, only Lionel Messi sees that ball and can make that placement and with the perfect touch and and all that stuff and so I, this was like one of those moments where it's a reminder that other MLS teams can't really do that because they don't have a player that they trust like that and everyone around them doesn't have a player that they trust to do to like they don't make those runs because they don't have a player that they feel is going to get that to them consistently and we do and of course Lionel Messi is awesome so um, I don't know how much more needs to be said about that but I, I wanted to give kudos to Diego Gomez, not just for the finish, but for just making that really smart run, I thought. 
Um, anything else in that first half that you felt was noteworthy? I um, was disappointed that some, not disappointed, but just, I think, resigned to the fact that some of the errors that we've been making throughout this season in the last few games continue to persist. Conceding that first goal, being sloppy in the passing, um, not being very press resistant, losing the ball in difficult positions, that creates our own problems. And I think at points, Inter Miami is its own worst enemy because this is a KC team that we should be dispatching with ease. And to go in 1-1 was, thankfully, it wasn't 1-0 and we we did go in um, at level at the halftime. But I felt like it was just us creating the problems for ourselves and Casey didn't necessarily have that much of a threat on us. And on the day that we play our best football, we would be able to dispatch this team very easily. Yeah, I agree. Um, there was one other moment in the first half that I saw live that didn't really pop out to me when I watched the game this morning, but Drake calendar has a, there's like a cross in the 12th minute and Drake calendar just kind of goes up palms. It brings it back down and just like destroys whatever cross or danger that was coming. And it didn't look like much. It looked relatively easy on TV, but in person, he really got up there quickly. And it was, I, I thought worth noting that it was more impressive than it, than it looked on TV. Um, you know, there's a couple other moments in that first half, but maybe we'll talk about them when we go into individual players. So moving into the second half, I was disappointed that we didn't get that second goal. We created plenty of dangerous upper opportunities or situations in that first half. So it felt to me like that second goal was coming. Even though it didn't come, I felt comfortable not changing things at halftime because I thought it was going to come. Um, and it does in the 51st minute. Lionel Messi with just a ridiculous goal. Um, I think it's probably his best or second best goal in terms of like just impressive moments for him since he got to enter Miami. He had a really nice goal against Nashville last year, but this one was like nice. What do you it's think? So, it's so weird that any other player scores that goal and we would be absolutely shocked at what an amazing goal that is. Lionel Messi does it and we're like, yeah, it's nice. It's a nice goal. It's a great goal. That's how big of a player he is. He makes the extraordinary look ordinary. And honestly, that's a fantastic goal if you think about it. The placement, the shot power, the way it dipped, the keeper bet. Even though it was mostly towards the keeper and not in the corner, the way the ball moved and dipped, he didn't have much of a chance. So beautiful goal, moment yeah. of magic. I saw some people say that maybe the goalkeeper was too far off his line, but I felt just for that situation, he wasn't. He was in a relatively decent spot because there was plenty of space between the back line and him, so he needs to be there in case there's a, a ball played in. And so, and you just don't expect a shot like that. If anyone else on our team made that shot, it would be the goal of the year. And for 90% of the other players on the team, it would be the goal of their career. Um, it was just phenomenal. And again, like it's, it's just Lionel Messi, so... You're not even surprised, but still, it's just amazing. I thought we were going to run with run away with the game at this point. Um, we were really the the more dangerous team, and I felt the game really changed after our first goal because their back line decided that, or at least their team decided, the point of confrontation was going to be much deeper in their own in their own half, and that opened up the midfield and made it very easy for us to progress the ball. And I think that was like what changed the game, and so. Throughout the rest of the game, I felt we were going to be the more dangerous team. We scored the second goal, and I think I thought we were just going to take it away. They do tie the game, though, 58th minute. It's off a set piece. Uh, it's off a corner. The ball gets headed away by Luis Suarez, but it kind of comes right back to Eric Tommy. He takes a first touch on the volley, off the post, and in. We'll talk a little bit about their transition defense and their set piece defense, but were you, like, screaming at the TV at this, or is this just, like claps off to a really nice nice place ball by the by Tommy. I I'm just two thoughts, right? First, we're dominating, we're on top, we don't capitalize. And then we lose our heads in a set piece. It was a fantastic goal, great volley. I thought Calendar could have maybe done better. I don't know. It was just one of those things where you're just left to wonder whether the Either the defender could have been a little bit more close to the uh, to Tommy, or 
you know, calendar could have maybe done better, but yeah, I'm, I'm, it's wishful thinking, right? It was a great goal. Unfortunate to concede when we were on top of the game and it, it felt like a bit of a pendulum shift. Thankfully, not too much, but we always have these moments where we sort of lose concentration and just concede these weird chances, whether off set pieces or whether in game. And it just annoys, annoys me a lot. Here's what I'll say about that. I, I, I disagree with some of these comments. I didn't think that was a savable. I mean, that was a really nice placement. I thought Calendar, who's on the other side of the goal when he's trying to defend the, the cross in, the corner in, has to come across his goal and he's in fine position. The ball just hits the one inch spot that it could have and to, to still rattle in. Um, just well placed by Tommy. I, a lucky shot for sure, but um, well placed. So kudos to him because he did that twice. And uh, unlike the first one where I didn't think we got a great replay angle to see what calendar maybe would have been able to do, this one I felt was just not... I, could, I, I couldn't expect any goalkeeper to make that save. Um, but I think for the defense in general, seeing that Tommy three on that um, yeah, on the edge of the box, I, I would expect somebody to go up to him well, to try and so So if you, if you watch it again, Julian Gressel's there. And it's like, this is what I'm saying it has to be perfect because there's maybe six inches between Julian Gressel and like mm -hmm. the end, the, the goalpost. And he has to put it right there in order to, to get a goal. So Gressel wasn't on him like maybe he could have been, but he was still yeah. in between him and the goal. And, you know, he, he made it a much more difficult shot. But credit to Tommy for, for putting it there. Um, that was a 58th minute. It's tied at 2 2. At that point, I'm. I go to the kid next to me who's an inner Miami fan and I ask him how you feeling? And he said, I think inner Miami is going to win. And I said, I agree. And, uh, it comes in the 71st minute, Diego Gomez, they try and play out from the back. Melia puts the ball to, uh, Jake Davis. Diego Gomez presses him hard, gets the turnover is on the baseline, driving forward, cross to the low and perfectly like the perfect power on his cross to Luis Suarez, who puts in the back of the net, Inter Miami goes up 3-2. Thoughts on this goal? Beautifully done again, single-handedly changing the game. Diego Gomez, hats off, take a bow son, because presses really well, wins the ball cleanly, does the hard part, but then goes on and delivers the perfect cross on a plate to Luis Suarez, who, of course, the striker that he is, is in the right position. The most beautiful part about that cross was that there was the defender was there, but the the cross was so good that the defender could do nothing, and it just the landed touch, the touch straight. Perfect. It was, yeah, the perfect. Touch was perfect, perfectly weighted, perfectly placed. All Suarez had to do was just tap it in. Beautiful. And also, beautiful goal. it was I, not a Travella, but it was with the toe of his foot. It wasn't yeah. like he had a you know the perfect body placement and everything to get a perfect pass off. Really well, really well placed, and it's just the kind of thing that last year he didn't have even close. He would have like cross that into the side netting type of player last year. Now he's putting it not just in the right spot, but with the right touch. Um, like I said, we'll talk about Comez more, I'm sure. And that's it, man. We will get into Tata and we'll talk about some of the subs because I want to talk about how they saw this game out and how that sort of manifested because last week against Colorado, they weren't able to do that. And I think they did that much better in this game. But I kind of want to say that for when we talk about Tata. So any other moments in this game that you wanted to touch on that wouldn't go fitting with our awards or our conversation about uh, Tata and the tactics? Uh, I think I'd like to commend the defensive structure. I think we we were well settled into that 4-4-2. And as I said, Casey didn't necessarily have too much threat apart from the chances that we let them have. So uh, other than all the opportunities that we let them create by losing the ball in dangerous positions, if we had been a little bit more clinical in our passing and with how we were playing um, from the back, I think we could have shut down this KC attack completely and utterly. So I think we created our own problems, but in the 4-4-2 defensive uh, structure, we looked decent. And I think that's the way we need to go forward try and prevent those offensive transitions because we look a lot better when we are in that 4-4-2 defensive structure. Yeah, just having four in the back keeps it easy in terms of the responsibility of the two center backs. 
And that's, I mean, that's one of my biggest gripes about the back three is you spread the three center backs out way too far. And then whose responsibility is to cover the center becomes a little bit more confusing and it takes a little bit more individual talent. And so having two center backs know they have to stay tight and have to stay disciplined in the middle of the field really just makes it easier for them. And you know, then yes, you force your fullbacks to get back, but they also know they have to do it. And so um, it just makes it easier, I think, mentally and better structurally. Let's spend a few minutes talking about KC. I didn't think they were excellent. Um, I think I, I kind of like their one-two punch of Alan Polito and William Agata because they have really good athleticism and power in Agata, and then Polito's a smart player. And so I can see how those two are really dangerous. And I didn't think they were like an excellent team like we saw with maybe the Alley Galaxy in terms of the firepower. But they've scored a lot of goals, and you can see how maybe they do that. Even if it wasn't consistently dangerous in this game, they still put up two goals. And so that's going to help you be very successful. Yeah, I think they'll be a decent team. I don't think they're a phenomenal team. Uh, they've got uh, Agata was creating a bit of an issue for our back line, and we needed to be in our top game to try and stop him. He was making runs in behind. I, I think there was one run in the first half where Aviles had to track back and um basically put in a tackle to stop stop the goal and again Polito as the number 10 played well but yeah they were they were good they were good not great I hear what you're saying about those balls over the top but this is another reason why I think the back four is so much better because yeah. the two center backs play centrally and then they don't give that inside leverage so even if you do get the ball over their heads they're forcing the the, the oh, well it was a god in this case to to go wide to collect the mm -hmm. ball. Then he had to either, you know, there, there was no one making runs or he had to try and hold up the ball to wait for his teammates to come. And he wasn't being, he wasn't allowed to be put in a position where he could be individually dangerous off of one touch. And that's not always the case when we're in the back three because they can get, the opposing team can get inside leverage and then you have a, a, a corridor towards goal and that can be really dangerous. Um, the other player I want to mention for them and I think this really held Miami was Jake Davis, their right back, who was playing, um, you know, on that side of the pitch with Diego Gomez and Jordi Alba. And I think maybe he's a solid player going forward, good on the ball, but he was really struggling to be in the right position in this game. I think he found himself, you know, Diego Gomez was pulling back into the midfield and he wasn't sure if he should go over them. Uh, Diego Gomez was cutting inside, staying wide. Uh, Jordi Alba was making overlapping runs. He was, kind of struggling to to find himself in good positions and i think that was really one of the keys that opened up this game for miami jordi jordi apple was really good down that left side especially in the first half and so i wanted to point that out because we've talked about how the best way to defend this inter miami team is to stay tight and stay really disciplined and i feel like he was not staying disciplined and not staying well structured so i wanted to point that out yeah, but I think I agree with you. Jordi Alba had a really good game first half and second half as well. I think he was really good. Um, but that interplay between Gomez and Jordi Alba worked a lot better than the left side has been working in the past few games. I think Gomez, with his ability to play in the midfield and with his ability to make the runs as well, was doing sort of everything on that left side, which really affects how the right back would like to track him and if he pulls off with diego gomez into the midfield he leaves an entire space open for jordi alba to exploit and run in behind which jordi alba was doing really really well and there were plenty of chances for him to just get in behind that uh casey defense because that right side was completely open for them because of how menacing gomez was so i think that combination worked really really well in this game yeah i I think we've seen some things that we like from Leo Alfonso. Works hard, has some athleticism, but there's a big difference between him and a guy like Robert Taylor or a guy like Dale Gomez, as we saw last night, where they just have so many more facets to their game. They're so much more dangerous in the final third. They're so much they have so much more experience at those levels. So they're making better decisions. They're pulling guys out of place. I mean, it's just it's just not the same thing. And so can Leo Alfonso be a guy that you spot start or, or get a few minutes off the bench? Sure. But I, I, I understand why we didn't want to play him against Monterey or even start yep. him in this game. Okay. Let's talk about the team for a few minutes before I, I just have one big question before we talk about Tata Martino and his decisions, but 
this team kind of got embarrassed on Wednesday night. They looked lackluster. They didn't have a lot of ideas, and they got beat up for it on the road in Mexico. Do you think that the players had a good response? Like energy-wise, decision-making-wise, determination-wise, stuff like that. Yes. I'm not sure. I haven't thought about this enough because I feel this game didn't necessarily change my opinion of how the season has gone so far. I didn't come out of this game thinking, oh, everything's okay. And I didn't expect to come out of this th- game thinking that everything's now, you know, rectified and we're playing our best football, or whatever. But I think the the team had a good response because we went down once, we drew level again because we let them concede, and we had a decent response. I think the issue is that we rely a little bit too much on singular moments and our best players to try and bail us out. We still haven't been playing as a cohesive unit of 11 men. And there have been instances in the game where we have laps of concentration, either by the defense or by the midfield, where we lose out. At the end of the day, I was happy with the three points. I don't think we were fantastic. I think we were good. We deserve to win. And that's all we can ask for, I think. Yeah, I I will say this. I wasn't looking for that in this game. I talked about this on Friday yeah. night when we talked about the Monterey game. This game, they went straight from Mexico to St. Louis, uh, to Kansas City. This next week, they're going to go back home. They're going to have some training sessions. They're going to be able to rest and recover and sort of talk to themselves about what they want the next two months to look like because we're going to lose some guys this summer to international competitions whether it's the copa america or the olympics or whatever and so we need to really go on a run if we're gonna if we're gonna make a play at the supporter shield we need to really go on a run and i think that needs to start next week and so that's what i'm really going to be looking for i will say i wasn't impressed with how they started the game i would have hoped that they came out sort of on fire but again it wasn't really something i was yeah, for me, for me, the result was more important than the overall performance because the turnover has been, what, three days since we played Monterey. So it's, yeah, you don't expect the world to change in three days, even though you want it to. So. Yeah, well, this this week, I think I'm going to be I'm going to be keeping an eye out for it next weekend. Mm-hmm. They travel to actually they host Nashville next week on Saturday. Um, OK, let's talk about Tata Martino for 10 minutes. He, I thought, got everything wrong and then refused to do anything about it on a Wednesday. I thought it was embarrassing and just a capitulation is the word that keeps coming. It was to just not try anything in the second half of the Monterey game, whether it was subs or tactical changes or or really anything. What do you think about this game from him? I think this game was even more damning evidence for how bad the Monterey decision making was because we had a similar personnel we were still lacking that left wing side and we played the 4-2-3 we we used a different formation than we normally would this was a new formation that we had in terms of playing gomez in the left wing position because that's the first time he's played that role so and i understand ruiz wasn't playing in that first game so there was deficiencies there but it just goes to show that you can play around with the same personnel just have different tactics and have a different setup. You don't need to make subs to affect a game. And the fact that we went back to the 4-3-3 uh, or the 4-2-3-1 with the similar personnel in play, I just, yeah, it just makes me wonder why Tata didn't actually do anything, whether it was making subs in that game against Monterey or even making in-game decisions to try and tactically switch certain things up. Um, I think he did okay this game. I think he set the team up uh, well enough. But more than the tactics, it was the individual performances that brought us out of the hole that we dug for ourselves. We still can't play from the back really well. We struggle with our passing. Our midfield struggles to um, play pinpoint passing and get the ball in the right areas and be press resistant. And I don't think we can... um, go with the same play style over a long distance throughout the season unless we change something either tactically or personnel wise i'm going to say something i'm going to say a few things that might contradict what i said on friday in monterey 
but I guess my the first thing I want to say is there's a time and place for everything. Tata wants to play out of the back. And so forcing your players to play out of the back is going to make them more comfortable doing it so that by the end of the season, they're much more comfortable doing it, right? Drake Callender, as we've seen, he's he can make a mistake. Um, Toto Aviles, he can make a mistake. Noah Allen, he can make a mistake. Nico Freda can make a mistake. Jello Wigan can make I mean, every, every single player on our back line can make a mistake. Jordi Alba can make a, a few mistake, mistakes. Right? Yes. Okay. So I understand the wanting to play out of the back to build a team, force a team to do it so they get more comfortable and confident doing it. The reason why I was so upset about it on Wednesday is because you're not playing for the playoffs in that game. You're playing for that game. And so if it's not working right away, you got to scrap it. You don't, you can't just force your way through it and give up two goals because it, it, then you're done. Right. This game, I feel it's the opposite where, yeah, if you give up a goal because you turn the ball over, it's like, if that helps you be more efficient in September or in November, then it's, then it's worth it. So I, I'm not as worried about that. If that's what they want to do long-term, it's just in the do or die games, must win games. That's when I'm, you know, I, I'm a little bit more. And that's just like, as a coach, you have to know, and, and and you have to tell make sure your players know like if if it's not working right now because they're pressing too hard or they're bigger faster more organized than we thought they would be you have to go long because we can't risk a mistake this game is not the same so i'm not as worried about that in this game i also really like the fact that he went back to a four in the back i thought he had to do that because it's just i think if he went with the same lineup in this game as he went with on Wednesday, we would have lost again because we weren't, we wouldn't have scored three goals. Um, Dio Gomez wasn't, wouldn't, wouldn't have been able to make those runs playing from where he was. And Jordi Alba, who gets, who is staying higher up the pitch and coming back and forth in this game gets lost in translation. And that's when he can be really dangerous and find open pockets. So I really liked what they did, man. And I thought the substitutes were really good. We can talk about those in, in a second, but, um, and then there's one other thing I want to, mentioned because I heard Taylor Twelman talk about this in the on the uh, broadcast and he talks about how Inter Miami doesn't have verticality because they don't have any speed burners over the top and how you know in this game Diego Gomez was their verticality or whatever and I think that's really misses what the meaning of verticality is because it's not about playing the ball over the top it's about playing very quickly and if that's through the defense that's also okay as long as it's quick and you're catching the defense out of structure and making it easier for you to create goal scoring opportunities in the final third. And this team, especially with Messi and Suarez, and sometimes with Julian Gressel and sometimes with Diego Gomez, they can move the ball so quickly and they can make such smart, creative runs beyond the back line that they don't need the athleticism to still move the ball up the field very quickly. And that's what we saw in this game, I think, when we had some opportunities to move really quickly because we have Lionel Messi. And it's really just because Lionel Messi and sometimes Luis Suarez, we can move the ball so fast that the defense doesn't get settled in. And because in this specific game, we allowed Jordi Alba to get up the field unguarded and we allowed Diego Gomez to be in that front line, we created outlets for that real speed and precision where if you only have Messi and Suarez, you really only have one outlet, and if they guard that, it's it's just a dead dead end. Yeah, I think to your point about um, verticality specifically, and I've noticed this a lot in the MLS. I think the the term verticality and its implications are used imperfectly in the MLS, especially by the commentators. Um, I've never I've never heard the word verticality even being referenced once in a Premier League game or a La Liga game, and. I think the the MLS understanding or what the what Taylor Twelman specifically thinks of verticality is having players run in behind and having um, players make those forward runs from uh, behind the defenders and try and offer a vertical option there. I think it's not just that; it's also the fact that you make line breaking passes. So, of course, the the. Yeah. The pitch is divided horizontally like this, right? So you can have either players running down vertical to try and create that vertical threat, or you play vertically by making those line breaking passes, which Leonel Messi, Luis Suarez, Jordi Alba, and even Sergio Busquets know how well to do. So it's not just about the players being a vertical threat. You can move the ball in a vertical manner as well to create those line breaking options to try and move the ball faster. And I think 
Inter Miami, while not, while may not have that level of vertical personnel who likes to run in behind the, the defense or run in through uh, the opposition, we do still make those line breaking passes, which are the vertical threat that we create, and that's how we create our vertical threat. So, yeah, I completely agree with your point there, and um, having players of Lionel Messi's um, caliber and Luis Suarez and Jordi Alba allows us to create that vertical threat by moving the ball in a line-breaking manner. And and listen, it's more nuanced than that. It's not just making a line-breaking pass from one line to the next. It's doing it with quickness. It's getting smart runs that get your player with the ball in between the back line and the goalkeeper. But it's just that we have guys that make really smart runs and we have players that can play those passes that most players just can't because they have that vision and they can do it really quickly. That creates this sort of verticality to our game that doesn't require playing long balls over the top like so many teams rely on. So I just, okay. So that brings me to a point. I wanted to establish that. Lionel Messi is so dangerous that the opposing back line is afraid to get beat by him. And so they stay farther back because they don't want to get embarrassed. And I understand that, and that's human. But what that does is it creates so much space in the midfield and between the back line and the the opposing back line and the opposing midfield that it allows players like Lionel Messi or Luis Suarez or Diego Gomez or Jordi Alba or whoever, Julian Gressel, although not in this game, Cello Wiegand, although not in this game, to get into that middle area and then have time and space on the ball to then pinpoint those passes as they go through. And so I think it's I think this is like the thing about Lionel Messi is that he scares opposing back lines into creating more space between the front and back line and the midfield and the back line. And then that space creates the time and and uh well the time he needs or any other player needs to really be dangerous offensively. And because we have the verticality, we make those good runs, that's how we create so many dangerous opportunities, whether it's down the left side with uh, Jordi Alba, whether it's through the middle because Luis Suarez or Theo Gomez makes a really nice run, or Robert Taylor, or it's down the right side where Julian Gress will find someone making a sort of a, a lateral run but and then puts it in behind the defense. It creates a lot of options. And so that, to me, is what we create when we go on this 4 through 3 with Messi in that right wing spot and it worked really well tonight you want to talk about the set piece defense and the transition defense set pieces are our kryptonite in a lot of ways we how many goals have we conceded do we have the statistics in that we have conceded a lot of goals um on set pieces this season and i i'm not sure whether that's because it's not because we don't have the height to defend it. I think it has a lot to do with our marking and our concentration. For me, we just lose our... I, I know we had this conversation about what we would change if we were the coaching staff in trying to um, improve our set piece defending. I feel a lot of it just comes down to taking responsibility of the man that you are marking and just making sure that you understand that if there's a loose person out there, if someone has, if another player has let their player, their um, marked player go, the the player who's closest to them needs to take that responsibility. So it, I don't think we do a man marking in our set pieces and our set piece defending. I do. I think we do a zonal marking and that doesn't really help our cause because agree, if yeah. one player, if one player gets loose, then he's just, free to um take a shot on goal so i think there's it's a lot about taking responsibility it's a lot about being you know conscious of um what's happening around you and i feel like this this team just doesn't have that level of concentration set pieces yeah our two weaknesses that we can easily pinpoint are our transition defense and our set piece defense and that's what we gave up one of each today um I, I was just I wanted to look it up because I think they had a, a fair number of corners. Um, they had five corners and maybe one or two other set pieces from realistic situations. And they only had one dangerous opportunity. and i I also think that was sort of a little lucky that they converted on that opportunity. So I'm not 
disappointed or dismayed by the set piece defense in this game. And yes, Taylor Twelman will read a stat two weeks from now talking about how Inter Miami's given up six set piece goals and it's or whatever it is. And but this one doesn't bother me as much. It's just sort of a, a lucky bounce for them. The transition defense is just if you want to be good at defending transitions when you're outnumbered, you need to have excellent center backs and de- or defenders that are good at one-on-one defending. And we don't, and that's okay because this is the MLS and very few teams do. And those that do are, are relatively lucky. So I get that. The way to stop it is to stop turning the ball over in dangerous situations. And we saw Cello Wiegand turn the ball over in a really dangerous situation, and we got punished for it. So it's lucky that we were able to score three goals and get three points, and so we don't have to like dwell on that because that could have been really bad if we don't win this game. But, yeah, Anton makes a good point. We do give up a lot of corners, which <laughs> maybe is another problem that we need to look at. But And I think that those two yeah. are interlinked, right? So we we give the ball away in dangerous situations we let leave ourselves exposed on the transition and that creates a lot of chances which leads to a lot of corners because then great calendars have to is forced to make saves or the defense is forced to make blocks and that just leads to a lot more opportunities whether it's through open play or in the corners as well and yeah i completely agree with you i think our transition defense is it's a bit of a joke now that if into my, if you turn over into Miami and if you press high and they, they lose the ball in a, a difficult position, you basically have a run through on goal because we don't have the legs in defense or the midfield to try and stop that. It improved a lot when uh, Frederico Redondo started playing in that midfield. Um, I think his positioning and his uh, ability to be that defensive um, buffer before the back line really helped stop some of those defensive transitions and listen you're going to concede a lot of those when you're playing so offensively and when you're playing so aggressively up top when you push a lot of your midfield up to try and create the opportunities you're going to get that you're going to get defensive transitions um but we need to start figuring out how we're going to plug those gaps with a lack of a pacey defender and then a lack of a midfielder or a defensive midfielder who's going to be able to sit in behind, uh, sit in front of that defense to stop those transitions. Because that's the way we lose out in a lot of the situations and that's the way we let go of a lot of chances. And a better team is going to punish us like Monterey did. On Wednesday, or maybe Tuesday, our midweek episode, we're going to be grading every transaction that Inter Miami did this this winter, and we'll go one, you know, through each one and kind of give a grade in our thoughts. But one of the things they didn't do was add a really star level defender. And maybe at the end we'll talk about what we want to see over the next two weeks before the window closes, or maybe what we want to see in the summer. And it feels like that could be something we see in the summer at least something they could try because there will be a lot of players from Europe that are going to be they either out of try. contracts or in a transition where they might be gettable, especially with some rule changes coming to MLS. Okay. So I think, I think that got the game plan right going in mm-hmm. and because he got it right, he didn't need to make any in-game adjustments. So sort of an incomplete on the in-game adjustments, but a check mark for the, the setup. So the last thing is substitutes. Um, we saw three, Julian Gressel came off in the 67th minute. Benjamin Kramaski came on. I don't know if you have an award for him later, but um, I thought he was good. Boy, man. I thought, I okay, so then we'll just hold off on that one. Um, but yeah, I thought I thought Gressel was not good, and I think he had to come off. And Kramaski, you know, we want to see Kramaski, and he's getting healthy, and he needs minutes. And so I thought that was the right decision. Jordi Alba comes off in the 78th minute because he's hurt, so... You know, his options were Franco Negri or No Allen, and he puts in Negri. I think that's the right choice. And then the last one I want, I do want to talk about because I think it made a, a serious difference was taking Diego Gomez off in the 93rd minute and bringing on Yannick Bright. We talked about last weekend when they played Colorado how they didn't see the game out at the end. They were just playing offensively, trying to get that third goal, and they never switched it back to just seeing out the game with a 2-1 lead, and then they got hurt and punished in transition and they lose two points because of it. This move, to me, signaled, guys, it's time to go defensive and just see the game out. By taking off an attacker, a left winger, and putting on Yannick Bright, who's a defensive midfielder, who, by the way, had some nice interceptions, you're telling your team, you're signaling to them, guys, it's time, 
and listen, it came in the 93rd minute and not the 83rd minute, but still better late than never. And to see him making that adjustment, Tata, to say, guys, it's time to to sit on this and kill it, I thought was really a good sign based on what we saw over the last couple of weeks. Yeah, I still think it could have come slightly earlier. Um, I agree. I agree. But the fact that he made that uh, change and allowed Yannick Bright to have a few minutes in the pitch, and I agree with you, I think he brings a lot to the team defensively. I would like to see him start a couple of games in the next few weeks um, just to see how our team reacts when he's on the pitch. But yeah, overall, I think I would give Tata 7 out of 10. Um, He had a decent game. Especially after that Monterey debacle, he sort of got back into his groove. Still under <laughs> fraud watch from my end, but we'll see. We'll see how he continues to play. Yeah, like I like I said last time, he's now fireable, and so everything deserves criticism. But at the same time, if he gets it right, he deserves credit. So I thought and again, he gets this checked. wasn't a perfect game by any means, uh, but I think it was a good start to what we can now starting start to build, especially with more training coming in over the week. Well, let me ask you a question. If if Cello Wigan doesn't turn the ball over in the sixth minute and um, Eric Tommy's goal goes off the post in the 58th minute and we win this game 3 nothing, I actually feel like this was a really good performance for 85 minutes or so. Not Orlando City good, but good. Not like phenomenal, but good. Um, so I, I, I give two check marks to Tata and, and no in-game adjustments needed. So just an incomplete for that one. Anything else on Tata before we switch over to our awards? Okay, then let's do it. Our first award, as always, is the Miami Man of the Match. Feels like there's two options, which feels like uh, you're primed to go with someone else. But we'll see. Who is it this week? Because you get to give it out. I can give it out to Lionel Messi. I think he had a fantastic, fantastic game. Big influence overall on the game in terms of the goal that he scored was absolutely phenomenal. The pass that he unlocked absolutely changed the face of the game because we were 1-0 down. But I'm going to give it to Diego Gomez because I think he was just as good as Lionel Messi in terms of his impact on this team and this game. The first goal, he made that run. If he doesn't make that run, that pass doesn't come through. He had a fantastic shot. I don't think the keeper could have saved that. Definitely deserved that first goal. I think he was a menace in that left wing side. He definitely helped unlock Jordi Alba as well and allowed that left side to be so threatening in terms of how much chances we were creating from that side. And then the third goal was all him from start to finish. That that ability to try and intercept the ball, the, the press that he put on, winning the ball cleanly, and then delivering that absolutely pinpoint pass to Luis Suarez, who literally had to just tap it in. Kudos to him. The fact that he went from playing in the midfield in the last game to now left wing and had just as much of an impact as he's been having throughout the season goes to show that this is a completely different player from what we saw last season. I agree 100%. In fact, I think you're not giving him enough credit. That first goal, he makes a really smart run and has a nice finish. Hard and I literally line. said that goal would not happen if he doesn't make that, that run. Hold on. I haven't gotten to it yet. <laughs> the second goal, you guys may want to go back and watch the highlight tape, but that starts because Tim Melia plays the ball to their left back and Diego Gomez chases him down and forces him to make a bad pass. He passes it right to Sergio Busquets who makes a dump off to David Ruiz, who makes the dump off to Lionel Messi, who then scores. That turnover is caused by Diego Gomez. So that second goal also gets some credit going. To, I mean, don't get me wrong, Messi with a great finish, but Diego Gomez gets some credit for creating that possession because just all-out effort on the other side of the field, he's just chasing the ball down and making it difficult. And we've talked about how he's a menace, but he, he, that was just another example, and it turned into a goal. And then the third goal, it, it's just individual freakishness because he creates the turnover and then he puts a pinpoint cross not you know he doesn't get the side of his foot he has to hit it with his toe it's the perfect um placement and power and everything um steve monios makes a good point that he did play a little bit in the left wing last year and he you know he played in the midfield he wasn't a starter for this team last year 
the midfield was Kermaski, it was Dixon Arroyo, and it was Sergio Busquets at the end of the year. And the left winger was Robert Taylor. And that was like Diego Gomez was a bench player. And one of the reasons is because when he did start, he was very, he was, he lacked clinicalness. I don't know if that's a word, but he lacked that final touch, whether it was a shot or a pass. And I've said this so many times that the thing for him this year was to be clinical. But I'm, I remember last season, if he had that opportunity for the third goal and he was trying to make a cross into uh, Luis Suarez, he would have kicked the ball straight into the side of the net. And that first goal, he would have put that ball three yards wide because he just didn't have that precision in that final moment. And now that he has it, he is a phenomenal player. Last year, he also was a little bit of a hothead running into players. He still gets yellow cards, but it's more strategic and it's more controlled. He was sort of a, you know, playing with his pants on fire last year. So he's really calmed down in the midfield and made smarter decisions with the same energy and physicality and athleticism. And then also that final pass, that final product is, it's just a night and day. He's just so much better than last season. So I agree with you, man of the match. And he was really good. He's playing very mature football, which is fantastic to see. Okay. Our second award goes to the player that's not doing the right thing. We call it the heron that flew north. Florida herons, they don't fly north, and most birds don't. And so if you're doing that, you're doing the wrong thing. And uh, it comes to me to give it out for this game, and I am giving it to Julian Gressel. I didn't think he was very good. I thought he had a lot of turnovers. I thought that he was uh, not just our worst player, but you know we had two players I thought weren't great, but I thought he was really bad. And he had a lot of turnovers, and... When he got called, when he got subbed out, he looked at Tata like, Me, you're taking me out? Like he was surprised. And that surprised me too, because I thought throughout the game he had really bad touches, a lot of turnovers, not in the right space at the right time. And so if you're playing in that midfield spot, you know, we talked about our transition defense. You can't be turning the ball over like that. And so Julian Gressel. A hundred percent agree with you. I had an award ready for him in case you didn't give him the <laughs> Heron that flew north award. He's been running to the ground, man. He's played what twenty games consecutively, and as the games have gone on, he's become less and less effective to the point that now I think he's a bit of a detriment on that in that combination with Sergio Busquets. His game has slowed down considerably. Whenever he gets the ball, he we like to play quick passes. I think. He stops us from doing that because he likes to take a touch on the ball. In recent games, at least, that's what I'm seeing from him. He likes to take his touch. He likes to be a little bit more, um, I don't want to say ball hogging, but he wants to keep hold of the ball before he lets go of it. He takes a lot of time in making things happen. And that hurts this team because we like to play on quick passing, quick touches, one touch passing. And he's been losing a lot of the ball. He hasn't been making the runs that are effective in behind. And one of his biggest qualities, which is putting balls into the box, I don't think I saw him do that once in this last game. He's well, not having a great time. Yeah, he's not having a great time. And I think he needs to be benched for at least the next couple of games before he's br brought back into the 14 fold. With Ben Hakramaski coming back, with Yannick Bright in the, in the wings, I think there's there's a good chance to say that he might be a bench option from now on. We keep saying that, and he keeps starting. So <laughs> he's more resilient. I will say, watching him live, he looks a little bit more athletic than he looks on TV. And so I can see how a coach wouldn't notice that as much as we might on TV. Um, Sergio Busquets is better than him. Diego Gomez is better than him. Kermaski and Ruiz are more athletic and I think f can be more tactically flexible than him. Yannick Bright is just a different profile, but you know, the thing he does well is better. And, and Federico Redondo, I think is better than him. So I'm worried about Julian Gressel and I'm worried about how Tata sees Julian Gressel, where he feels like this is a guy I convinced to come to Miami and I have to play him because He's a guy I like, and he's a guy that's been with me for a long time. And I need to, I need to reward him coming to play for me by giving him playing time. 
And I don't, I agree with you. I think that there's a lot of midfield options that don't include Julian Kressel that might be better. And I'm worried that Tata is going to keep giving him minutes to prove, maybe prove to himself that he made the right decision bringing in Julian Gressel or to prove to Julian that, you know, he's still one of the core players on this team. Um, so I think we're going to get a lot more Julian Gressel, uh, at least for the foreseeable future, at least until Redondo comes back. Um, yeah, I think we're going to see a lot of Julian Gressel this year. And I don't mind that necessarily. I just, I do want to see him get a game off because I agree with you. I think he's getting tired and I think, at least getting a game off would be helpful. We saw Toto Abilas get a game, half a game off a couple, maybe a week or two ago. And I think that did him good. So yeah, I would like to see him get a game off. I would also say that he is not a big compliment to Cello Wiegand either. Those two have not been working really well together. And I know yeah, we I, discussed. I think it that, might just be because Gressel is, it's just, he needs, he needs to yeah, get a week or two off. And yeah. I think, Cello is the kind of player who likes to play on the quick pace as well. And I don't think he's been able to make those overlapping runs when Gressel's on that right side of the pitch. Of course, he hasn't been great himself, so I don't want to take away any blame or put Gressel's blame on Wigan. But I think those two haven't been the best in terms of their combination play. And it'll be interesting to see if Ben Kramaski comes into the right side of the midfield how Wigan reacts, but again, I just think Russell's tired and he needs to have a few games off and maybe come off the bench. Now listen, I'm looking at the schedule. In the next two weeks, we play Nashville and the Revs, and those two feel like games that he's going to want Julian Gressel on the pitch for because we're going to have to break down the team that's trying to defend us and the Revs aren't very good. So I, I think Julian Gressel is going to keep starting, um, but I think today he was the worst player, or at least the player doing the wrong thing. Heron, that flew north. Julian Gressel. Okay, let's go to your first award. Keep it moving. What you got? I'm going to go with the Prince That Was Promised Award. I think you can you can guess uh, this pretty easily. Let me guess. This is Benjamin Kermaski. Yes, it is. Indeed it is. Talk to me about him. His first two touches of game involvements almost led to a chance. Dude, I had flashbacks to that, that the, the goal against the wild. Red Bulls last year. That was yeah. wild. Yeah. But that's what makes me so excited about having him back. I think he's going to be a starter for this team as soon as he's fit enough to, to play. And I'm very excited to see what he brings to this midfield because the issues that we're facing in defensive transition, the issues that we're facing in keeping the ball, he might be able to plug that up very um quickly i don't want to hype him up because i feel like we, every time we hype up a player too much he disappoints us and then we're like oh damn this didn't come through but i think he's as much quality if not better than diego gomez and just imagine having both of them in that midfield with sergio busquets sitting there it's going to be phenomenal and i can't wait to see that combination especially with redondo out it's going to be absolutely fascinating how he more than more than me expecting them to be good. I am waiting and anticipating to see how that midfield plays. But so, so important to have Benjamin Kramaski back. And I think he's going to do a world of wonder for this team. Well, I think as long as Robert Taylor's out, I think you just move Diego Gomez to that left wing left spot. Wing, and then yeah. you can have Kramaski and Julian Gressel and Busquets in the same midfield. Or you can, I mean, I feel like him and David Ruiz are in the same spot right now. And I think Kramaski is probably a step ahead and at least in terms of what he can do going forward um it was good to see him back he made some dangerous plays i thought after those first five or seven minutes he was trying to be a little more safe on the ball yeah which may have bothered me again on wednesday when we needed to score but in this game i was totally fine with but that's smart so, right you managed the yeah, game yeah. yeah 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 and so yeah dude it's good to see him back he looks athletic he looks solid and so i think we're gonna get you know I think we're going to get eight to 10 goal contributions out of him this year. And, you know, I, I'm excited to have him back. All right, your turn. Okay, I'm giving out the Rick James Award. Any guesses? No idea. You'll need I will to explain say, the award to me. I will say there's about 10 people I still want to talk about in this game. But yeah, one deserves to be talked about more than any other. The Rick James Award. Rick James is this pop star, singer, rock star, whatever. And he came out with the 1981 hit 
classic super freak. And that's my explanation. Any guesses? Lionel Messi. Of course, Lionel Messi. He had an assist. He had a world-class goal. Diego Gomez was phenomenal. But other than that, he was the man of the match. Dude, he's so good. And it's so great to have him back. He opens up the entire field. He is he can come back and organize. He can be he can play on the front. You know, I, I just I don't even know what else to say because he's so good. And I love it. Um yeah, at this point, I don't even know if we should give awards to him, man. Like he's just that good. He's way beyond anything we can assign to him. So as I said, he changed the game in our favor. If we conceded a goal, another goal, I would have still been like, okay, Messi can bring this back for us. That one pass was so phenomenal. If any other player did it, we'd be drooling right now. But the fact and that goal as well. So the fact that Messi does it day in, day out is absolutely ridiculous at this point. But yeah, easily could have been the man of the match as well if Diego Gomez didn't have that beast of a performance. That pass, it makes me think of Bryce Duke because Bryce Duke would make a pass that was like half as good as that, but still nice. And he would do that once a month and we'd think, okay, this guy has something. And Lionel Messi does something twice as impressive every single game. He's back. He's healthy. He looks good. Hopefully he can just play week in and week out all the way up until Copa America. You know, Not that he need, doesn't need to come off the bench sometimes or whatever, but he stays healthy up until Copa America. And so we get a nice two-month run with him. I was never a Lionel Messi fan or Barcelona fan over the last 15 years, so I I never saw him game in and At game out until, well, or, or just game in and game out until he came here. And it's just, he, he had that seven, eight game stretch in the League's Cup where it was amazing, but then he was dealing with injuries and in and out of the lineup. And, you know, he only played three or four games earlier this season before he started coming in that lineup. And so I just really want to see a nice long stretch of Lionel Messi week in and week out. Yep. Obviously. Hopefully we get that. <laughs> Okay, let's hear your next award. The next award's the Traffic Cone Award. Does that go to uh, Toto Aviles? Ooh, close. Nico Ferri. Okay. Good award. He was really good. Yep. I think worth discussing. Our defense hasn't been great in the last few games. And like a traffic cone... He placed himself in a position that did not allow a car to pass through. And by a car, I mean the KC offense. I think he was really good, man. I think he had some really good um, defensive play throughout. He was uh, aerially very strong. And I, yeah, I, I think he deserves to be talked about in terms of keeping that uh, scoreline to 3-2 and not more. Um, overall, I think despite the fact that we conceded two goals, I don't think KC had too much of a threat in their offense. And he had a good recovery run a few times. He was complimenting Aviles really well. And the two of them, I think, partner up really well together. But I think he had a good game, especially after that Monterey game was a bit of a um, disaster for our defense. But overall, I'm happy with his performance. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I was going to give him an award, too. Um, he had, I, I re I rewatched the game. He had one or two turnovers in the first 15 minutes mm -hmm. or so when we were struggling to, to progress through the midfield. But other than that, he was locked down. He has a presence. He's much bigger than Toto Aviles, and he's much bigger than Sergei Kristoff physically, and he has more of a presence than them physically. I think he's going to be a real weapon or advantage for us on set pieces. I think he does make us better there. And yeah, dude, in this game, I thought it was really good, especially in the second half. And he, my award for him was going to be something like it's closing time or it's time to like shut the doors because we talked about shutting the game down and. I don't think he's as good as Kamal Miller progressing the ball. I don't think he's as good as Kamal Miller just feeling comfortable on the ball and being part of the offense and being part of the team. But when it comes to shutting the game down and rejecting all advances in the final 10 minutes, he's the guy I want. Um, I really like that about him. I hope he can stay healthy because I know that's been a challenge for him over the last couple of years. Yeah, I think the next step for this team as a whole is just to have a consistent starting 11 that can play in every week and, you know, build that chemistry together because I think we've had so many changes right now with players going out and that's the next step that this team needs to just be a little bit more consistent in their starting 11. Whether it's one player going out every week is fine, but 
constantly changing your defense, constantly changing your midfield doesn't really help. And now I'm hoping we can build a solid center back partnership with him and Aviles and kick on from here. There are so many people I still want to talk about. Um, Okay, my final award and the final award of the show is going to be the Dead End Award. Mm. Is this Marcelo Wiegen? <laughs> it is not. Oh. It is going to Toto Aviles uh-huh. because what we didn't mention at any point in the last hour and 10 minutes is that Toto Aviles had a not a last man block, but a really important block right before the first half ended. And then another one early in the second half. Drake calendar. I don't, I mean, we will never know where their shots were going, but they, to me seem like the two most dangerous opportunities for real um, sporting KC in this game. And Toto Avila shut them both down with just two huge blocks where I think maybe in both of them, he was the last man. And so, uh, when the ball was coming his way in this game, he, it was a sort of a dead end because he was blocking it. And um, I thought he deserved some praise for that. And, you know, he's been sort of up and down this season, but he had a good performance tonight, I think. Yeah, no, I mentioned that recovery run and the block that he made in the first half was absolutely phenomenal. He did well. Again, solid in the back line. I, w- I don't think he's to blame um, entirely for any of the two goals. For me, I think he needs to now be a little bit more um, pragmatic and a little bit more sharp in his passing because yeah. he can definitely be a bit of a loose cannon when it comes to passing from the back. And he's not great when he's pressed. So he needs to start working on that. And if he realizes that and if he works on that, he can be a very comprehensive defender for us because he's only 19 and he's one of our starting center backs. So hopefully you can kick on from these performances and just get better on the ball as well. Yeah. It kind of goes back to what I was saying earlier, where there's a time and a place to force your team to play out of the back. And it's in a game like this, where you're playing a West coast team, it's not a six point difference in game. And you have a 19 year old that is going to improve by being forced to do it. This is the time to do it. And so I agree with you. He's going to continue to make mistakes because he's a young player, but hopefully by the time we get to September and it's winning time or hopefully November and it's winning time we he's ready to go and he's ironed out a lot of those. So, um, and then defensively, he's got all the tools. So I will say he's, he's a yellow card machine right now. I think he's one away from getting a suspension, but anyways, he's not again, a couple other players, I think had noteworthy performances. We don't have to give him an award or, or too much, but, uh, cello weekend, I thought really struggled. Um, yeah, I thought he didn't have a good game. I, you know, I, I here's what I'll say about him in both this game and in the Monterey game. He didn't have a good start. And then he sort of just stayed back and played safe. And in the Monterey game, it was a problem because we needed to go out and score goals and create opportunities. And this game, it was OK because he kind of just disappeared and didn't do anything wrong. But I, I still didn't think he had a great game. Yannick Bright, a few nice touches. Anything on Yannick Bright you want to say? I think he now needs to get a little bit longer than just five minutes in the pitch towards the end of the game. I know Tata started him once this season already, but um, I think Tata needs to be a little bit more brave in his midfield composition because Gresso isn't working out and Tata needs to realize that. And hopefully with someone like a Yannick Bright, I think he can be like a direct replacement to Redondo, even though they're not same players, but... At this point in time, with the way this roster has been structured, he can really help unlock Sergio Busquets by having that defensive um, presence in the midfield. So I would like to now start see him, you know, play next to Sergio Busquets and see what that does to Sergio Busquets' game, but also what impact Yannick Bright can have. But exciting prospect, really exciting prospect. Yeah, and listen, if he's if his role is you're going to come on in the 80th minute if we have the lead and you're going to help us shut it down, I would I would love that for him. Yeah, and yeah. Um, you know, occasional star when you need to rotate or whatever. But that would that feels like a role that he could be really good at. Um, Franco Negri comes on for Jordi Alba 
and maybe we should talk about him for a minute because we don't know how serious Jordi Alba's injury is. But Negri's good, dude. He looks to me more athletic than he was last season. He looks in better shape, and he's still got the technical ability. And I think maybe he's going to play even better because he's got more talent around him that he can sort of combine with and, and stuff like that. Thoughts on Negri? Worrying signs about Alba because I think – he didn't look good when he was holding the hamstring, so I'm not sure he, how he did walk it is. off under his own power, yeah. though. So I don't, which you know, is always we'll good. See. Yeah, but yeah, I it couldn't have happened. At, okay, this may sound weird, but it couldn't have happened at the best possible time. Yeah, with Negri coming back, <laughs> thank God he's recovered and back healthy to try and plug the gap when Jordi Alba is out. I'm not sure how many games he's going to be out for. But that position doesn't worry me because I know Negri is really good and he's going to have a good impact regardless. So hopefully Jordi Alba isn't, isn't too hurt. But regardless, I think Negri is a good backup. Yeah, and the last player I kind of wrote down was Luis Suarez. He gets a goal. Uh, yeah, I didn't think he had a phenomenal game, but he's just keeps chugging along. And I, I think he's. I think even when he doesn't have good games, he's still going to find ways to score and have an impact. So... He's still Luis Suarez. And it could have easily been Diego Gomez passing into a, you know empty space. So Suarez had to be there to be able to score. And he may not have an impact throughout the 90 minutes, but he has a tendency to just show up in the right place in the right time. And somehow he just keeps getting goal contributions, assists, and I'm not complaining. So good for him. Yeah. Um, there's two comments I saw in the chat as we were doing this that I kind of wanted to star and come back to. Uh, the first one is from Anton. If Calendar's out for a month this summer, I could see why they may be looking for an upgrade on Santos. Um, referring to the Copa America because Calendar has been with the U.S. Men's National Team. I don't think he's going to be with the with the U.S. Men's National Team for the Copa America. Um, I think they're going to look to bring goalkeepers from Europe who are in the offseason so they don't force a player like Calendar to miss a month of games with his team just because he's the third choice goalkeeper for Copa America. So I expect that to be a Gabriel Salonina or um, someone like that, where he's a goalkeeper in Europe who he's going to be the third choice keeper. He's probably not going to play at all. And so why take him away from his team for a month? Um, and then the last one is this, which I think is a little interesting. Do you think that we're going to use that last international slot before April 23rd, which is the transfer deadline for the winter window? I think that's being prepared for the summer. Yeah, I. we've been connected with Matthias Rojas for so long, and I do think we could use an attacker that I could see it being used on him if that settles itself in the next two weeks or next nine days. But it feels like that's not going to settle itself, so I think they're just going to save it for the summer. They don't actually have a roster spot available for him, even though they have the international roster slot, so they have to move a player out anyways. I think we might get a, a clear out this summer if things don't, changed with how things have gone so yeah i don't i don't think other than maybe matthias rojas we're going to use that spot um and i've heard a certain name i might be looking for a new team so you never know okay guys well uh, that was our recap of last night's game 3-2 win against sporting kansas city at arrowhead we'll be back in the midweek for a midweek episode i mentioned it earlier we're going to talk about uh, we're going to grade some of the transactions over the course of this winter window, going all the way back to um, not bringing back Joseph Martinez. So the entire window, we have a video coming tomorrow that's just a fun YouTube video, so I encourage you guys to check it out. It's just going to be about 10 minutes or so. And other than that, uh, this was fun. Anything you want to say before we sign off, Sor? No, finally a win. Hopefully plenty more to come. And yeah, ends the weekend on a high. Yeah, let's get this be let's have this be the first of many. Other than that, guys, it was a lot of fun and we'll see you next time. Enjoy your week.